In this lecture, we will be covering two of the most common disabilities of childhood, cerebral palsy and neural tube defects. I have split the lecture into two parts. The first will be cerebral palsy, and part two will be neural tube defects. Cerebral palsy describes a group of disorders involving movement and posture caused by a non-progressive disturbance of the developing fetal or infant brain. The core components of this definition are highlighted in different colors. Going through each of these terms describes implies that cerebral palsy is a descriptive term for a characteristic constellation of clinical findings. A group of disorders signifies that cerebral palsy is caused by a heterogeneous group of pathophysiologic mechanisms. Movement and posture highlights that motor limitation must be present in a child in order to make the diagnosis of cerebral palsy. Examples of non-progressive disturbances include hypoxia, trauma, infection, congenital malformations, vascular insults such as hemorrhage and stroke, in addition to other non-progressive pathologies. Non-progressive means that these are monophasic, time-limited insults that do not progress or worsen with time. I would like to highlight that the diagnosis of cerebral palsy cannot be confidently made prior to the age of one year. Going back to the definition of CP, motor impairment must be made to make that diagnosis. And in particular, spasticity is usually apparent. Infants or newborns with brain insults are usually hypotonic and floppy shortly after birth. Spasticity is usually not evident prior to the age of nine months. So spasticity and motor impairment are usually not evident prior to the age of nine months or even one year. In addition to the fact that the nature of the brain disturbance is not always obvious at birth. The nature of the disturbance, whether progressive or non-progressive, is sometimes difficult to discern prior to the age of one year. For these reasons, the diagnosis of CP as a descriptive term cannot be made confidently prior to the age of one year. Please remember that CP is the long-term sequela of injury to the developing brain. It is not the acute manifestation of that injury. The classification of cerebral palsy relies on the predominant type of motor disorder encountered on examination. Spasticity is the most common motor sign seen in patients with cerebral palsy. Dyskinesias, such as dystonia, may also be encountered. Ataxic forms are on occasion seen. And many of these patients may have mixed presentations, for example, having spasticity and dystonia. The distribution of the motor impairment includes diplegia, which means that the lower limbs are involved more than the upper limbs, or monoplegia, hemiplegia, and quadriplegia. In full-term infants, the most common form is the hemiplegic form, usually secondary to a congenital stroke in the distribution of the middle cerebral artery. Other pathologies, however, may be found on MRI, such as periventricular atrophy or cerebral malformations. In infants born prematurely, diplegic cerebral palsy is the commonest form encountered. 
There are two pathologies that contribute to CP in premature infants, periventricular leukomalacia, PVL, and intraventricular hemorrhage, IVH. PVL, as the name implies, is a loss of white matter fibers in the areas surrounding the lateral ventricles. These are the areas where the posterior limb of the internal capsules run, which is responsible for muscle tone and muscle control of the legs, giving rise to the development of the diplegic form of cerebral palsy. Both PVL and intraventricular hemorrhage are mostly encountered in infants born up to 28 weeks of gestation. After 28 weeks of gestation, the susceptibility to, to these two pathologies gradually falls. This is a CT scan of an infant with PVL. The ventricles full of CSF have a hypo-intense signal. The color is black. You can appreciate the cystic areas around the ventricles with a similar intensity to the CSF owing to loss of white matter fibers and replacement by CSF. This is another CT scan depicting intraventricular hemorrhage. You can see the blood filling the ventricles and also involving the brain tissue surrounding the ventricles. The dyskinetic form of cerebral palsy is mostly seen in term infants with severe asphyxia, but is also seen in kernicterus. Kernicterus is the long-term sequela and encephalopathy from severe neonatal hyperbilirubinemia. Kernicterus is usually a combination of the dystonic or dyskinetic form of cerebral palsy associated with typically hearing loss and loss of upgaze. While children with cerebral palsy may have associated neurological disabilities such as seizures and intellectual disabilities, these problems are not implied or necessarily present in patients with cerebral palsy. However, these children should be evaluated for the presence of these comorbidities. Cerebral palsy is difficult to prevent and is considered primarily a developmental event. And while hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy frequently comes to mind in children with CP as an underlying etiology, Hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is actually only one type or one etiological pathophysiology in children with cerebral palsy. Hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is a syndrome characterized by clinical and lab evidence of brain injury from asphyxia. When the neonatal brain sustains injury and asphyxia from a hypoxic insult, this hypoxia also involves other organ systems. So there will usually be lab evidence of renal hypoxia, such as elevated creatinine or acute tubular necrosis, evidence of hepatic involvement, such as elevation of transaminases. There may also be evidence of involvement of the GI system where infants with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy may also have evidence of necrotizing enterocolitis. So when the brain suffers significant hypoxia, this hypoxia does not usually spare other organ systems, which is usually evident from lab findings. Abnormal babies, such as, such as infants with growth retardation or infants of diabetic mothers, or infants who are dysmorphic are most vulnerable to intrapartum asphyxia. So asphyxia in these cases could be a prenatal event prior to the onset of the delivery process.
all of these criteria must apply for the diagnosis of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy to be made with confidence. Metabolic acidosis in fetal umbilical cord, a persistent low APGAR score, multiple organ involvement as previously discussed, and exclusion of other identifiable etiologies for the clinical or lab manifestations seen. Hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy has a range of severity, from mild hypoxia leading to an agitated, irritable infant with hyperactive reflexes, progressing to moderate or severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy with progressive lethargy and stupor. The most commonly encountered risk factors in children with cerebral palsy are a history of congenital malformations or low birth weight below two kilos. Other risk factors include twin gestation, the presence of infection, and birth asphyxia as discussed previously. Congenital malformations and low birth weight are inherent to the growing fetus and are difficult to prevent. Additionally, they are independent of the delivery process. Infants born prematurely have a much higher risk of developing cerebral palsy owing to the two pathologies of PVL and IVH discussed previously. The lower the birth weight and gestational age, the higher the risk of developing cerebral palsy of the diplegic form. The clinical presentation and age of diagnosis of cerebral palsy does depend in large part on the severity of the brain insult causing the cerebral palsy. In more severely affected infants, an earlier presentation in the neonatal period with poor interaction, irritability, poor feeding, seizures is encountered. In infants with less severe insults, the neonatal period may be completely normal with evidence of motor delay or spasticity seen after one year of age. So these children may present, for example, at one year of age with the onset of toe walking or present at the age of 18 months or two years of age with delayed walking, squint, communication problems, and abnormal movement patterns may also be seen. Children with cerebral palsy have an upper motor neuron syndrome dominating the motor examination and the clinical picture in these cases. The upper motor neuron syndrome includes positive symptoms such as spasticity and persistent primitive reflexes and negative symptoms such as weakness and loss of fine motor control. Both positive and negative symptoms contribute to the motor disabilities that these children have. This is an example of a child with cerebral palsy. You can appreciate the scissoring, which is spasticity and increased tone in the adductor muscles of the hips, and toe walking, which is spasticity and increased tone in bilateral gastrocnemius muscles. He also prefers the W sitting posture, owing to spasticity of the hamstring muscles. These are typical abnormal movement patterns seen in children with cerebral palsy. This child has the diplegic form of CP, where the lower limbs are involved much more than the upper limbs. So the early signs of cerebral palsy or the early signs predicting the future development of cerebral palsy in a newborn or in the first year of life include microcephaly, poor feeding and communication, the persistence of primitive reflexes, the absence of postural reflexes and protective reflexes such as the parachute reflex and abnormal obligatory postures such as the W sitting 
we just saw, visual problems such as squint are also quite common. The investigations of cerebral palsy also depend on the age of presentation. So infants or neonates who present early on with microcephaly or feeding problems will require a head ultrasound or CT scan. Children or toddlers presenting at a later age will require an MRI of the brain. And children who have other major organ malformations dysmorphic features or a positive family history, genetic testing is valuable and lab investigations are ordered as indicated. The mainstay of management of cerebral palsy is the management of the spasticity. Physical therapy, long-term physical therapy, regular physical therapy is indicated in almost all patients. To prevent, the, to prevent the occurrence of contractures. Contractures are not only limiting for ambulation, but can also be a source of pain. Equipment needs such as orthotics, walkers, and wheelchairs must be met. The provision of these equipments can help the child ambulate independently and improve his quality of life. Spasticity can also be managed with medical treatments such as systematically administered benzodiazepines or baclofen, or targeted treatments such as botulinum toxin injections. Hip displacement is a common complication in children who have scissoring and abnormal movement patterns. Drooling Secondary to swallowing dysfunction is also a frequent complaint. Drooling can cause tooth decay, dehydration, excoriation in the perioral and neck area, in addition to being socially disruptive. Seizures may be seen and require treatment, and specific learning and communication difficulties must also be addressed. The management of children with cerebral palsy is a multidisciplinary approach. Gastroenterology complications include failure to thrive. Constipation is very common in children who have impaired ambulation. Difficulty swallowing and aspiration. Gastroesophageal reflux is almost always encountered with more severely affected children. Pulmonary complications are aspiration, and in premature infants, chronic lung disease may also be a compounding factor. Neural tube defects are the second most common disability in childhood following cerebral palsy, and the second most common congenital anomaly after cardiac defects, which means that you're bound during your rotations in the pediatric department or in the NICU to encounter a child with a neural tube defect. Neural tube defects can be apparent with an obvious cystic lesion in the lower back or occult where intact skin covers the spinal cord defect. Occult spina bifida is asymptomatic in the newborn period. So as an overview, neural tube defects are a severe birth defect of the central nervous system, basically leading to absence of the segment of the nervous system involved in the failure of the neural tube closure. They can either be open or closed, as previously discussed, and the prototypical um, picture of neural tube defects that comes to mind is the myelomeningocele, where you have a bony defect, mostly involving the lumbar vertebral canal, and a protruding cystic mass. This leads to flaccid lower limb weakness because the segment of the spinal cord below the level of the lesion 
is completely absent, leading to complete absence of innervation of the lower limbs and a flaccid weakness. There is usually an associated hydrocaph and usually an impairment in bowel and bladder control. And this is a schematic of the major events that take place during primary neurulation, which usually takes place in the first three to four weeks of gestation. And if you remember from embryology that the neural plate folds to form a neural tube, which then closes in sort of a zipper fashion, starting at the craniocervical junction, where you have rostral or upward closure leading to formation of the brain and downward caudal uh, closure leading to formation of the spinal cord. Arrest of this closure process at any point leads to a neural tube defect. Neural tube defects can be closed with protrusion of CSF coverings or the meningeal coverings and a meningocele without involvement or protrusion of central nervous system tissue or open defects where you have protrusion of the central nervous system with myelomeningocele or myelocele. In order of decreasing severity, in this situation, there is total failure of neurulation. So the neural tube defect completely failed to close in the caudal and rostral uh, directions. This is a very early defect occurring no later than 20 to 22 days of gestation. And understandably, these cases are mostly stillborn. So there is no central nervous system tissue formation. In anencephaly, there is fa failure of anterior neural tube closure. So the brain does not form. There's polyhydramnias because of poor swallowing effort. And some of them have persistent brainstem function, but it is also incompatible with life. In myelos cases, there is failure of posterior neural tube defects. In encephalocele,s it is a restricted disorder of anterior neural tube closure. So the anterior neural tube closes except for a small segment, which leads to a cystic protrusion either anteriorly or posteriorly from the, from the forebrain. It's mostly posterior and occipital, and 50% of these cases are complicated by hydrocaf. So the cystic lesion that you see in the illustration would contain skin, meningeal coverings, cerebrospinal fluid, and segments of the um, posterior brain. In myelomeningocele, it is a restricted failure of posterior neural tube closure. So the neural tube closes till it reaches the lumbar area where there is a rest of that closure leading to failure of further um, uh, development of the spinal cord. It's an early defect as well, no later than 28 days of gestation. The majority are lumbar and in all of these situations, the skeleton is deficient, so there are no vertebrae below the level of the lesion. The etiology of neural tube defects is multifactorial. Genetic factors play a major role, and it is believed that certain environmental risk factors coupled with genetic predisposition lead to these defects. The major environmental risk factors include folic acid deficiency, 
and maternal folic acid supplementation significantly reduces the occurrence of neural tube defects, in addition to maternal diabetes, obesity, and maternal fever, or even an increase in the ambient temperature, such as the excessive use, for example, of hot tubs or jacuzzis. These were found in epidemiological studies to be strongly associated with um, the presence of neural tube defects. The prenatal diagnosis of neural tube defects is through elevated maternal serum alpha-fetoprotein. <clears throat> alpha-fetoprotein is highly concentrated in the fetal yolk sac, and in cases of open neural tube defects, leakage into the amniotic fluid can be detected. This is combined with fetal ultrasound, and there are specific findings on fetal ultrasound that are indicative of the presence of a neural tube defect. Optimally, what's usually um, practiced is amniotic fluid testing at 14 to 16 weeks or maternal serum at 16 to 18 weeks in combination with fetal ultrasound around 18 to 22 weeks of gestation. The clinical features of the neural tube defect depend on the level of the defect. And as you can expect, the lower the level of the lesion, the better the neurological outcome. Assessment of functional level is very important. It can predict future capacities. For example, lesions below S1 are usually able to walk, whereas lesions above L2 will be wheelchair dependent. The clinical signs are those of a lower motor neuron type, secondary to complete absence of innervation to the affected limbs. There are motor and sensory deficits below the lesion. Flaccidity and areflexia. The sensory deficit is in the distribution of the dermatomes innervated by the defective segment. Bladder and bowel dysfunction are uniformly present, except in lesions below S2. This table um, illustrates some examples of clinical findings and defects according to the segment involved in the neural tube defect. The Chiari 2 malformation is present in nearly every case of lumbar involvement in neural tube defects. Chiari 2 malformation plays a significant clinical role in the morbidity associated with these defects. It contributes to the formation of hydrocephalus in addition to presenting with brainstem dysfunction. This is a normal schematic of the brain with the cerebellum and its tonsils ending above the foramen magnum. In cases of Chiari 2 malformation, there is inferior displacement of the medulla and the fourth ventricle into the upper cervical canal. So there is a herniation type um, uh, malformation with inferior displacement of the lower cerebellum and a variety of bony defects. The elongation and thinning of the medulla and lower pons lead to brainstem dysfunction. This is an MRI image of a child with an obvious um, protruding cystic lesion in the lumbosacral spinal cord, in addition to the presence of a Chiari 2 malformation, where you can appreciate that the cerebellum and its tonsils are herniating through the spinal, uh, the cervical spinal canal. There is inferior displacement of the cerebellum and parts of the brainstem into the cervical spinal canal. <clears throat> 
This leads to feeding difficulties, breathing difficulties with apneic episodes, and actually 50% of deaths in infants with neural tube defects can be attributed to the brainstem dysfunction associated and complicating the KRE2 malformation. So, with neural tube defects, there's a protruding cystic lesion, as we mentioned prior, with flaccid lower limb weakness. In addition to chiari malformation and brainstem dysfunction in the neonatal period, complicated by hydrocaf. So, most patients with neural tube defects that you will encounter in uh, the pediatric floors or in the clinics have an operated neural tube defect in the lower back, and you will frequently find they also have a ventriculoperitoneal shunt. So this is the typical um, clinical scenario for patients with neural tube defects. And um, this is uh, regarding evaluating for the possibility of hydrocuff in the neonatal period through evaluation of the anterior fontanelle, head size. The site of lesion is very important. As we mentioned, in the presence of lumbar involvement, 90% will have hydrocaf. Neural tube defects are a devastating uh, malformation involving the CNS with grave manifestations of lower limb paralysis, loss of ambulation, in addition to other complications such as um, uh, renal impairment. So prevention of neural tube defects through prenatal folate supplementation and fortification of foods is imperative. The improvement of maternal general health also leads to lower uh, prevalence of neural tube defects such as improved nutritional status, obesity management, and avoiding maternal heat exposure. Once an infant is born with neural tube defects, one of the earliest treatment up, um, uh, decisions that are usually made is the early closure of the back within the first 48 hours with prophylactic antibiotics till the time of surgery. The management of neural tube defects is a team approach, a multidisciplinary team management. These patients obviously need neurosurgical treatment with early closure of the lesion within 48 hours and shunting for the presence of hydrocaf. Brainstem dysfunction also needs urgent management in the neonatal period. These infants may require ventilatory and airway support and may require gastrostomy feedings for severe dysphagia. The impairment in bladder control leads to incomplete emptying of the urinary bladder, recurrent urinary tract infections, and is frequently complicated by vesicourethral reflux leading to renal function impairment. In the neonatal period, investigations include renal ultrasound, MCUG, and a cystometrogram to evaluate the status of the bladder. Treatment includes clean intermittent catheterization, which is initially performed by the parents or caregivers and ultimately should be taught to the children by the time they are five to six years of age. Clean intermittent catheterization can achieve continence for these patients and prevent pooling of um, urine in the bladder and further complications. Orthopedic management includes managing spinal deformities, which are quite common, the presence of paralytic hip dislocations, and there's also a high risk for spontaneous fractures related to the immobility of these patients. A bowel program is indicated to time elimination of stool and to prevent continuous leaking of 
stool. A peculiar, a peculiar allergy that these patients have is latex allergy. They are at risk for obesity, which decreases their functional abilities and can also be at risk for precocious puberty in the presence of hydrocaf or midline um, uh, uh, brain, uh, brain abnormalities. Now, occult neural tube defects, as we mentioned, are usually asymptomatic in the newborn period. We suspect occult neural tube defects in the presence of dermal stigmata, such as abnormal collection of hair in the lower back, cutaneous abnormalities, a cutaneous dimple or tract, or the presence of a subcutaneous mass. And this is the reason that back examination or careful back examination is a routine part of newborn examination. This is an example of a child with a subcutaneous lower back um, mass in addition to the presence of a tuft of hair. Spina bifida occulta or occult dysraphic states where the skin is intact as we mentioned, have a delayed presentation. They may present with delay in development of sphincter control or delay in motor milestones, such as delayed walking. They may present with asymmetry in the feet or the calves, maybe with back pain, or in cases of a tract or sinus that is communicating with the subarachnoid space, they may present with the recurrent meningitis. In the neonatal period, in cases where a dermal stigmata is um, picked up, a neonatal ultrasound may suffice to rule out an occult dysraphic state. In, later on in life, radiographs are indicated. And in cases of a um, sinus or a tract, an MRI of the spine would be indicated to um, assess whether the tract is actually communicating with the subarachnoid space. Surgery is the mainstay of treatment to prevent infection in cases of a tract or sinus and to prevent traction injury to the spinal cord. These occult dysraphic states are usually associated with tethering of the spinal cord to the vertebral column. So the spinal cord is stuck to the vertebral column rather than being free. As the child grows in height, this leads to progressive stretching of the spinal cord because of its immobility and tethering to the um, uh, vertebral column. So in summary, neural tube defects are a significant cause of disability. Appropriate management does improve the quality of life significantly and improves function. Urologic complications are a major cause of morbidity and examine the lower back in all infants.